Hi and welcome. This is the first in a series of bonus lectures I've decided to create to um, cover a couple of extra topics that I think will give you a better understanding of how the Bitcoin works. Uh, these lectures are optional and this course is self-contained, meaning you'll have a pretty good idea of what the Bitcoin is all about without the lectures. However, these lectures are meant to elaborate a little bit more deeply on certain topics. This lecture is on cryptography and I'm going to explain the fundamentals of cryptography and we're going to kind of work our way towards the cryptographic protocol that the Bitcoin uses. Okay, so cryptography in general can usually be explained in terms of two people talking to each other. This is the quintessential example we tend to use, the Alice and Bob. So let's say that you're Bob, and I'm going to give you a cape because Bob is an awesome guy. Okay, so Bob, here we go. And let's say Bob has a girlfriend, and her name is Alice. And you can see that um, I didn't go to art school. All right, so here is Alice. Okay, and Bob wants to go ahead and communicate with Alice securely. They want to send messages back and forth to each other. Well, here's the issue. Let's say Bob has a girlfriend, an ex-girlfriend, and her name is Eve. And they dated for a while, it was fun. Unfortunately, Eve is utterly crazy. And so, obviously, Bob no longer wishes to associate himself with Eve. Bob doesn't want to do anything, but Eve still thinks that they're together. And any message that Bob sends to Alice to and fro, Eve will intercept because she's very talented. And if she sees something like, I love you, this will draw Eve into a mad rage and she'll go and kill Alice. And Bob doesn't want that to happen. So we obviously need a way of securely communicating. So in general, how we think about secure communication is we tend to think about it in terms of either a shared key there we go. A shared key or a public private key. Okay, so let's begin with the shared key. Under the shared key case, Bob here and Alice, what they do is they meet up at the park, they go somewhere and they decide on a secret key K. Okay, so we'll write secret right here. And what Bob does is he takes a cryptographic function, it could be very many, and he takes this message he wants to tell Alice, and he uses that secret key, and it outputs a cryptographically secure message. So, let's say Eve intercepts it because she's very talented and very persistent. When she gets this message, it's garbage. She can't understand it. And it would take a very, very long time by brute force alone to try to go ahead and figure out what this message is. Billions of years or millions of years, more a lot of time, even factoring in the growth of computer rate. However, because Alice has that pre-shared key, that secret key, what Alice is able to do is take that secret key and it's going to go ahead and spit out the original message. And Eve will never know. She can never know that. So that's pre-shared keys. Uh, and this is called symmetric cryptography. Symmetric in that you use the same key to go ahead and encrypt and decrypt the messages. And for a long time, this happened to be the cryptographic paradigm that we lived in for a very, very, very long time. You'd use one key to encrypt, the same key to decrypt, and you'd share the key. And it would take some time and effort to go ahead and sh uh, share that key, uh, and thus encryption and decryption was kind of a luxury reserved by governments and so forth. But let's say Let's look at a new example. 
Well, here is, instead of Alice and Bob, let's go ahead and look at Amazon.com. Okay, so Amazon.com, I think this is their logo that has that A through Z thing. So Amazon.com, it, it lives in somewhere in California and they have many, many servers. Okay, do you go ahead, whenever you want to buy something securely on Amazon, drive out there with your car and go to their facility and say, oh, hey, give me the pre-shared keys so that I can securely give you my credit card number. No, it's madness. You don't do that. However, there are evil hackers out there who, if given the opportunity, would love to steal any insecure information over transit. Give him a cape because he's a bad guy and a monocle. There we go. So if you were just to go ahead and send your credit card number, this evil guy, let's call him James. My apologies if there's any James listening. Viewing is going to get your credit card number. But you can't drive to California to have a pre-shared key. This is impossible. There's no way you're going to be able to if it's going to be a scalable business to go ahead and grab that pre-shared key. So then a natural question is, how do we securely send something to Amazon without James here, who's very talented and very evil, figuring it out and making money off of us? Well, this is where the notion of a public-private key cryptographic scheme comes from. So the first was RSA, and it was vended by Ravis Shamir and Adelman. And what they basically did is they say, okay, what we're going to do is have a public key that everybody in the world knows. It's public. And we're going to call that K1. And so what Bob is going to do is he's going to take that encryption function. He's going to take the message that he wants to encrypt. He's going to take our public key and it's going to create an encrypted message. But there is no way to decrypt this message with that public key. Meaning if James was to intercept this encrypted message that's sent across the channel, James would not be able to decrypt it with just the public key. Instead, what we're going to have is a private key right over here. A private key. And this private key K1, excuse me, K2, allow somebody who has a message encrypted with a public key to be able to decrypt to be able to decrypt that message into the original message. Now the details of this system are a little complex. Um, in terms of RSA it involves integer factorization. The system that the Bitcoin uses is called elliptic curve digital signing algorithm. Uh, there are, are many systems. DLP is one. Uh, and there are some next generation public private key systems that have been invented that are very promising. But the general concept in all of these systems are always the same. A person wants to send a message to an entity that they've never met and they know nothing about. But they have verified that that entity has a public key. It belongs to that entity. This is Amazon.com's public key. And there's a very complex system of certificates and verification services and so forth that exists specifically to go ahead and ensure that people's identities are verified online. So you have used some sort of system your browser has to verify, yes, this is indeed Amazon.com. Then what you do is say, okay, give me your public key. You go ahead and take this encryption function. It's going to be the RSA function or something like that and you take the message you want to send alongside the public key and it creates an encrypted message. And when our good friend James here attempts to steal it, he's very frustrated, he's sad because he's not able to decrypt it, but the private key can. Now there's a relationship between the private key and the public key. K1 and K2 are related to each other, okay? In that the private key usually can build the public key. However, you can't go the other way. 
So going from this direction, it's a very quick operation. Going in the other direction, it's a very slow operation. It's one that would take lots and lots and lots of time. So this is kind of the cryptographic foundation of the Bitcoin. The general idea is that when we want to send money to somebody, so here's your Bitcoin. Yay, Bitcoin. Okay, so I want to send this Bitcoin from Charles to, let's say, James, because maybe we're working together. James is a good friend of mine. He sells McCain's. I want to send him one Bitcoin. It's a very expensive cane. Okay, so what I'm going to do is the Bitcoin network is going to say, well, Charles, it's really a wonderful thing that you assert that you own that Bitcoin. Okay, it's really a wonderful thing that you claim that you own this Bitcoin. However, you have to prove it. The Bitcoin has two parts using that digital signing algorithm. It has a public key and a private key. And everybody in the network understands the public key. Okay, but only I own the private key. It's the only person in the world that knows that. So using my private key, I can verify that I do own that Bitcoin and I am authorized to go ahead and transact it over to James. So only the person who holds the private key for a particular Bitcoin is capable of going ahead and transmitting that Bitcoin. And that assertion that you own it can be verified because people can do a test with that public key. So here's an example. Let's say I claim I own that key. I own. I own it. Okay, and you say, well, you prove it. So here's how we're going to do that. You're going to take something like candy. Okay? And you're going to treat me like James. You're going to take candy, you're going to take the public key, and you're going to encrypt it. With the public key. And it's going to spit out something, which is garbage, like this noise. Okay? And you're going to send me that noise. Now, if I am the owner of that public key, if I uh, produce that, then I'm going to be able to take that garbage, run my private key through it, and it's going to pop out candy. Okay? And I'm going to send it back to you. And so the question you're going to ask is, what did I send you, Charles? And I'm going to say, you sent me the string candy, or whatever test you want to use. The Bitcoin network works in a similar way for transactions. When you are transacting between two entities, entity one has to prove that they are the owner of the coin. And then when entity two receives that coin, entity two has now bound that coin to his public private key pair. And because Entity 2 is the only person who owns the private key, Entity 2 is now the only person who is capable of spending that key. So that's basically the Bitcoin's encryption in a nutshell. I'm not going to go over the elliptic curve digital signing algorithm, nor am I going to go over the protocols on how exactly this proof works. It's, uh, it's not necessary to really understand the cryptographic security. What is necessary to understand is that going from the public key to the private key with the particular algorithm is impossible in normal time. EC DSA is very secure. It's used by the CIA and also by the uh, NSA amongst other agencies. And so there's a consensus that uh, this cryptographic method is nearly unbreakable unless you have lots of special information and, and it's not been implemented correctly. Um, from the many thousands of security experts who have looked at the Bitcoin's implementation of ECDSA, along with all the other nifty security details of the Bitcoin, um, the network as a whole absolutely believes that um, the public-private key scheme that they've implemented and the authentication system that they've implemented is indeed secure. 
In fact, it's so secure, it's much, much more secure than regular online transactions. And this is why we say Bitcoins are, are better than credit cards or Bitcoins are better than cash transfers and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's all I have for you. If this lecture makes sense, go ahead and let me know. Um, if it doesn't make any sense at all, I'll, I'll try to redo it and become a better artist. And I hope that helps clear up a little bit of, of stuff about the concept of encryption and decryption as it relates to the Bitcoin. Thank you much and have a wonderful day.